Hi, welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. Wanted to let you know that the SAG After Foundation has a COVID-19 relief fund to support SAG After artists during this time. Information on how you can contribute can be found in the description of this video. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guests from Promising Young Woman. Please welcome writer, director, producer, Emerald Fennell, and star Carrie Mulligan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I always like to start by asking, because this is an audience of SAG after actors, how did you get your SAG card? And I love um, being able to ask Emerald this as well, because you are also well known as an actor. You're killing it on the crown right now. Um, so this question can actually apply to both of you. Although I don't know if you've done an American series or movie or if you have a SAG card. I don't have a SAG card. I have an equity card, which is the British Union. But no, I've never done anything in America yet. How'd you um, get your equity card? Uh, I believe it was the first job I did where, which, where I found out when we were filming Promising a Woman that Carrie also did, which was a TV series called Trial and Retribution, uh, which is like a sort of thrilling crime drama on in England so yeah we we discovered we'd actually been in a scene together um but only when we were filming we neither of us sort of weirdly neither of us remembered I suppose we must have been too nervous yeah I think so I think uh, yeah it was all and and we also realized only by looking it up on IMDb that Michael Fassbender was in the same episode playing a police detective which neither of us had ever and I've made a film with Michael Fassbender I had no idea um You're kidding. yeah uh, thank you, IMDb, for uh, making these connections. <laughs> Carrie, what about for you? I think it was um, Brothers, Jim Sheridan film, was my first. Yeah, that was my first American gig and where I would have got my SAG card. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you were already an Academy Award nominee by the no, time you Oh, did ed education come after? In education camp, yeah, because I did Brothers. That was my first job. And then I did um, a tiny part in Public Enemies, Michael Mann film, where I um, committed wholeheartedly and dyed my thus far completely undyed hair um, peroxide. And it um, was so badly damaged that I had to cut it all off, which is why I um, ended up with short hair through that whole thing. Yeah. No, that's why you had short hair? I, I assume that that was a... Oh. Yeah, I had it was just my hair was dead. I had no choice. So I'd shot, what had I done? Yeah, I'd shot an education, went straight from wrapping an education on the plane to Michael to do Public Enemies, dyed my hair white. It basically all fell out. I cut it all off. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then I was cut from the film, pretty much. How do you have a face for a pixie crop? I only ever pulled off that look when like somebody brilliant was doing my, but my everyday pixie cut look was remarkably unattractive. It just got made it like people could make it look good for photo shoots and things, but it wasn't, it was, God. They made it look really good. Oh, you know, what? the pandemic makes me want to cut all my hair off. I don't know why, but it's like, it's sort of one of, you know, you have those reactions where you're like, right, I'm going to dye my hair purple. I just really, all year have been like, ah, but I'm not going to do it. It's yeah. so funny because both those things you said, I tried to dye my hair purple and I cut off all my hair in the pandemic. So, so you've, you've, you've got my number. <laughs> Honestly, you could have used some of these amazing wigs in Promising Young Woman. <laughs> um, and this film, I mean, people have been talking about it since its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival. It's been almost a year, actually. Um, Emerald, I know you're an actor and an author. You've written for shows like Killing Eve, but this is your feature directorial debut. What made you want to tell the story and also make it to your film debut? I don't know. I wish, um, I think, I think so many things in this, like, well, this particular kind of job that we all do it, are fateful. And it was not planned that this was going to be the first film I've certainly written other films that you know um that like many people have died in the dark somewhere slowly of asphyxiation um <laughs> but and it just so happened that this was the first film that uh yeah that I was allowed to make I guess and I really but I knew from the get-go that it wasn't something I was going to write for some someone else mm. I was going to direct it or it wasn't going to you know, I wasn't going to give it to someone else because it was impossible to explain to people what I meant 
you know, and even when I showed, you know, the first cut of it to some of the producers and distributors, then it, that was kind of almost first moment. Everyone went, oh, okay, because it's, it's a hard sort of thing to describe, I guess, maybe. Did you ever have to pitch it to a studio or anything, or did you just have to write the scripts? And, and, and what, what was that pitch like? Oh, so, well, yes, I absolutely had to pitch it. And I pitched the first um, the pre-title sequence of the movie, which is a very, very drunk woman in a bar being kind of lecched on by a group of sort of horrible men. And then a nice guy saves her and then thinks that maybe she's kind of cute, takes her home for a drink and then as he's taking off her clothes and she's saying, what are you doing drunkenly and sits up and says, what are you doing? And she's sober. And obviously it was, it was a lot more detailed than that, the pitch that I did with a lot more voices and pizzazz, I hope. But I sort of, but I only pitched that. And then I explained that it was a revenge movie that, and that that was the kind of, that was the first moment. And so I pitched that and I was lucky in that lucky chap just came on board immediately, kind of almost no questions asked. So when I handed the script in, they were kind of ready for it to, you know, they, there was no kind of question that they were going to go for a kind of easy route. But certainly when I pitched it, some people were like, no, thank you. <laughs> one man said, uh, one man kind of stared into the abyss of sort of dark memories. Um, so that was both, you know, I was very glad to provoke that response, but also, you know, fair, fairly eager to exit the room. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but but like you're writing, there is a dark humor in everything you're saying um, and, a, and a lot of truth. Um, Carrie, how did the script find its way to you and, and what interested you in the role of Cassie? Yeah, so uh, Emerald sort of sent it um, via my agent who sent it to me with um, no kind of preamble at all. And I'd met Emerald again as a grown up um, at somebody's house, a sort of mutual friend's house quite brief, you know, for like 30 minutes um, over cake and tea around a Christmas tree, which was very English. Um, and Em was on her way to the Killing Eve rap party. And we'd sort of briefly chatted then. And I can't remember if she mentioned it at that point, but I don't think so. And so I was really excited because I'd sort of hung out with her for a minute and thought she was awesome. And then, so read it and just immediately felt like it was, you know, definitely one of the best scripts I've ever read and um, just full of uh, the most exciting stuff in the, in the first, you know, the first 20 pages, you just, you, you have no idea where you're going. And I, I think that keeps you the whole way through the film. And I loved not, not knowing where the film was going to take me and, and all the different things that I felt reading it. And um, and so, yeah, I was just completely, I knew kind of pretty much instinctively from reading it that I wanted to do it. Um, so I set up to meet um, like two days later and we sat down and in about five minutes, I sort of thanked her for letting me have the part and, and that was it really. Um, and in the meantime, Emerald had sent me a sort of playlist of music and some visual references, all of which really you know the emerald's vision of the film was so clear from day one the music that's in the film is predominantly music that was written into the script that was on the playlist that she sent me like the day i read it um and the way the film looks was was is it's like the mood board got big you know it's the every reference that emerald sent me sort of became the film um and i've i've just her clarity of vision in making it was just steadfast the whole way through she knew exactly what it was um so in in as an actor you're just like great you know, it's just so freeing because you just can put your absolute faith in somebody and um makes your job very easy do you mind if i ask what some of those visual references are because i love the look of this film so much so i'm i'm curious <laughs> I mean, it was a ton of stuff. It was like a kind of an insane amount of things in there. But there was um, there was some to die for, some virgin suicides, some American Psycho. Um, you know, actually, I I really loved the look of, and there was something kind of like sort of pleasingly subversive about those nineties kind of. Um, what is that channel that, that does kind of real life movies based on real life? Like that, Lifetime? Yes. Yeah. So there's <laughs> Lifetime 90s movies that were all called things like, you know, don't you dare take my child or 
Um, I thought he was the one, question mark. You know, that those kind of movies I just loved and I found them so, kind. there's something so sort of like, well, often they're very funny, but also not on purpose, but, but the, the look of them is so um, appealing. And there was a lot of murder she wrote even. So stuff that kind of had this kind of cosy, pretty, but also quite um, static feel to it. So it's sort of, it's sort of somewhere between reality and sort of another uncanny world. Please tell me you've seen Mother May I Sleep With Danger, which is a very famous Lifetime movie from the 90s with Tori Spelling. I, I, I'm pretty sure I have. <laughs> I, the one that I remember that I had, that I recorded off the TV with Tiffany Amber Thiessen in it. Um, but I can't remember what it was called, but it was sort of, also it was, it, they were the kind of movies that, that were actually talking about stuff that as a very young teenager, I was sort of, you know, a bit like Judy Bloom. There was this world suddenly of things being discussed that I sort of didn't know people could talk about yet. And I still think in a funny way, those kinds of movies still talk about things that mm -hmm. we think about a lot in the, in the way that they're not, maybe they're not treated as you know, serious cinema or whatever it is. But I love movies like that. I find them very gripping and um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, I need to find that Tim Tiffany Amber Thiessen one because it sounds right up my alley. Um, I actually want to talk about Cassie's look in the film because it's so specific and fascinating. These bright colors and sort of like, you know, her cotton candy colored rainbow nails. Um, did you sort of discuss the look together? Carrie, I don't know how much, um, you know, uh, collaboration is involved when you take on a character about discussing the look, but do you like having a say? Yeah, totally. I mean, it was you know, Emerald's sort of um, vision for the for the way that Cassie looked was quite clear. And that was such a, I was so excited to jump into that world. And I remember that one of the first things that Emerald said in our meeting was that, you know, she didn't want to make a film with about, a, a sort of film about a woman in a gray cardigan. You know, this wasn't going to be sort of a dark, serious looking place to, to be in. It was going to be inviting and it was going to be tactile. And, um, and that seemed, you know, that I was so on board with that. And it was really lots of conversations between Nancy, um, our amazing costume designer, and Emerald being in lots of our fittings um, and the three of us talking and, um, you know, Nancy's a genius and Emerald is. And so we just sort of all, it was all, um, a, that was a really fun part of it. Um, and, you know, we came, uh, and but Emerald on the mood board that she sent had the sort of, candy colored, various candy colored manicures. So that was always going to be big. And I, I, know, I, I such a big part, I sort of felt like when a nail fell off, I felt sort of like very panicked that I needed my full manicure to sort of, um, to do it. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a really, you know, and because there are so many different looks and she arms herself in so many different ways, it was, you know, it was a really fun part of it. And I think people might think, you know, because Cassie is dealing with so much, like, like she might dress down, but I love that instead you have her trying to look good, you know, like making the effort instead of, you know, sort of just retreating inside herself. Well, yeah, I think also if you retreat inside yourself, people are constantly asking if you're okay. The thing that a lot of people with addictive behavior and self-harming behavior are very, very good at is disguising this thing. And so it seemed, you know, it seemed very, if, if Cassie is an expert at the kind of smoke and mirrors, it sort of, it, it had to be in her daily life as much as her nightlife. She can only, they kind of feed into one another. She can only go out at night and do the things she does because during the day, no one questions her because she's, you know, got a fluffy jumper on and she seems to be highly functioning. And Carrie, uh, all the characters you've played, they always feel so lived in and authentic. I I'm curious, not only how, how you found your way into Cassie, but how do you generally prepare for characters? Do you, you know, write bios, do any special research? I'm sure it varies from role to role, but what was it like preparing for Cassie? Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, really, the majority of it for this was, was conversations with Emma, which was sort of lots of figuring out together what... Um, you know, what she had, what she was like before, really, what, you know, what, what was Cassie like when she was growing up and uh, and when she was, you know, first sort of friends with me, you know, what that relationship was. 
um, because all of this really felt like a sort of act of really extreme loyalty to somebody that she mm -hmm. loved. So um, it felt like it was important to start there with that relationship and that love and what Nina meant to her. And, um, and so that was just lots of chats between the two of us. Um, and, you know, there was sort of a few things that were helpful along the way, but um, the majority of it was, was that. And it was also our really close relationship when we were shooting in that, um, you know, we, we were always talking, like in between scenes, in between takes, you know, there was just, we were just constantly sort of figuring it out. So it wasn't like I came in with a sort of a bunch of decisions made. We sort of did what we needed to in terms of her backstory. And, um, but then throughout filming, it was like always little adjustments here and there and changing things. And also so impacted by the actors that were coming in, and, you know, who in the vast majority of which we didn't meet until the day of shooting. Um, so what they brought in was also like, completely change things and you know it's quite uh, I mean we have to talk about this amazing ensemble uh you cast a lot of actors that I think we've really come to love and trust over the years which I'm sure wasn't a coincidence <laughs> but people like Bo Burnham and Connie Britton and, and, and Adam Brody where where did you even begin I, I assume you started with your Cassie and, and moved from there Absolutely. Well, I, I just wanted to, I think, I just wanted the world around Cassie to be full of, to feel like the world feels, I suppose, which is that everyone goes about it thinking that they're good. And so this movie is more than anything about um, people who think they're good, realising they've done something that is profoundly bad. I think that's why it's so disquieting. And so... Um, you know, so when it came to casting people like Adam Brody and Chris Mintz Platt and Sam Richardson, and then even, you know, Alison Brie and Connie Britton, uh, you know, I wanted those to be those people that we inherently like. Because, you know, again, the movie isn't, it's not very, it's not necessarily terribly clear cut. Everyone feels, everyone has a very different idea of of what is where the boundaries are what who, who who they kind of ally themselves with so it was important i think that the audience up to a point is asked to be complicit and sort of it's a more of a challenge it wouldn't have been quite so it i think it would have been easier if cassie had just gone and visited a ton of horrific monsters yeah but actually you know it, it's it's more complicated than that as an actor yourself, you know what it's like to be on the other side of the audition table. I don't know if you actually auditioned actors for these or it was mainly offers, but what is it like when you're assembling a cast and you get to see it sort of from the other point of view? It was wonderful. It was a part of it that I sort of, that I really, really loved. I mean, luckily, the I didn't audition anyone, actually. I just met them and had a talk for a few hours, usually, you know, met them for a coffee or they would come in, like, talk at the office. And, yeah, you know, when it comes to people of this calibre, you know they're good. You know they're going to be brilliant. It's just that you want to get a sense of who they are. I think so much of why a set works is chemistry. Everyone kind of sharing the same kind of fundamental belief in, in the work and, and how to do it. And especially when you're making something in a shorter period of time on the kind of budget that we were, you know, you want to also get a sense that the people that you're meeting are like really comfortable uh, and are going to deliver. And you could, because it's not like we could drop even a, you know, even a shot of this movie, otherwise we'd have been doomed. So there was all of that kind of stuff. But mostly, yeah, it was just talking to people. I think that's so it's so useful um, to do that. And I, and having auditioned many times and had many catastrophically terrible auditions, I kind of know that watching people's work generally is much more useful than an audition. Chemistry reads are crucial. You know, Bo and Carey's chemistry read was like amazing, perfect. Um, but that's a different thing. Uh, it, auditions, I think, are, are just what did Jack Donaghy and um, Donaghy and Thirty Rock call them a grotesque carnival of human misery, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, that is how I have often felt. <laughs> yeah. Somebody being, you know, doing an audition—it's yeah. just brutal. 
<laughs> Carrie, I'm going to guess it's been a while since you auditioned for anything, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, I shouldn't assume that, but did you find you were good at it? I auditioned for Maestro. You auditioned for what? Maestro. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What was that experience like? Do you mind it? Or, you know, I know a lot of actors don't I like the process. Any opportunity, any opportunity I, I can take to prove to myself that I'm qualified to be there is, um, it's a really nice antidote to, you know, real imposter syndrome. So, um, no, I don't mind it. I, I mean, I've always been happy to audition. I do, I do like it and um i'm often better in the audition than i am in the movie i always find no i always find that the audition scene or you know i haven't had to do it a huge amount um thankfully um over the years recently but i always used to really nail the audition and then when i would get to doing that actual scene on the day i would just just completely ruin it and it was like i'd I don't know. I sort of felt like I'd done it already or I couldn't relive it. It was very, it's very distressing. Uh, but no, I like auditioning. I think it's, it's fun and it's, you know, nice to play. You're Such a healthy attitude. Uh, yeah. Really a genius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am curious though, you had a chemistry read with Bo Burnham, which makes sense because the film hinges so much on the chemistry, but what was that experience like? And, and was it pretty instantaneous because you guys just feel so natural and right together, if that makes sense. Yeah. He walked out and Emerald and I were both like, we love him. He's so sweet and lovely and hilarious and brilliant and so truthful um, and funny. And it just worked um, straight away. So yeah, we were, we were pretty set on both. Mm. everyone was amazing you know the thing that's so interesting being on the other side of it actually is that everyone who came in treated with Kerry was brilliant mm. but the thing I think with Bo that was so interesting was that uh, he does something different you know he, he literally does he's a director he's a stand-up comedian you know he acts as well but like so the just in terms of it's it's a different it's just a different feeling it's a different chemistry between two people who are kind of like interested in how the other person is doing what they're doing because I know that certainly like I always felt that Carrie without putting words in your mouth I always felt that Carrie was very impressed by things that Bo did and Bo was just blown away by everything Carrie did like in all the rushes it's just like you know the b-roll is thing is cutting and then you know, and then Bo being like, look at the way that she eats fries. It's so normal, you know, like just the kind of the stuff that Gary does that is so natural, the sort of natural being, you know, he was always so impressed. And that's what you want. You want two people who are going to be su going to surprise each other. Mm. I mean, this, this film is impossible to pigeonhole in, in a good way. It's a thriller, but also a black comedy. And, you know, at times a really wrenching drama. How were you able to balance all these tones? Was it, was it in the script or is some of that found on the day of the shoot or, or even in editing? I don't know. I think, I think that it, you have to be fairly... I think if you're making, almost in general, if you're making any film with this kind of um, schedule you have to be incredibly specific from the get-go. I've never been one of those people, and I've worked with directors in the past who are brilliant, who just come on set and say, what do we do today? Um, but for me, it's just like, there was no way. We had too much to fit in, so I had to be fairly kind of um, controlling about the how to steer it, I guess. But once you've cast the people who you think are brilliant, then, part of it is making everyone feel comfortable and not interfering that much. Like, I really do think, you know, I, I don't want, you don't want to micromanage people's performances. So, so much of the most beautiful stuff comes when you just let people go. And I hope that's kind of what we did, that I was, I was keeping a very, very close eye on, you know, the whole picture. But what's so amazing about having a lead like Carrie, who's so gifted, um, and so able to just, and such a good acting partner. So many actors are brilliant when it's on them. And, you know, when it's not, they're kind of there, if you're lucky. But I think the thing with Carrie is that she is in the scene for everyone at every point. 
and that makes everyone better and everyone good. So that made my job very easy. And Carrie, you have worked with so many amazing directors. Uh, generally, what do you like from a director when you show up for set? What are you sort of hoping for? Um, uh, somebody who, it's, I always describe it like someone who's like, <laughs> it seems such a weird way to describe it, but like someone who's sort of holding you like that. You know, they're like, their hand is firm, but they're, you know, you're sort of, you can rest there, um, but you're being kind of constantly pushed. Really terrible analogy. Basically somebody who knows exactly what they want, but don't make you feel like you're, you have to do it any particular way. Like Emerald's, what was so brilliant about Emerald is she absolutely knows what she wants it to be, but you have the freedom to basically go anywhere knowing that she will end up either choosing the take that works the best for the story and will never make you look bad, um, but will also push you way farther than you're comfortable with. And that was something for me that, you know, is always my sticking point is like, I'm always so afraid of doing something that feels not truthful that I'll go the opposite way and try and do less in an effort to be truthful, but actually not ultimately that good. So, you know, Emerald was so good at encouraging me to sort of push in places where I probably might have retreated um, and to, and also just creating an environment that's just so much fun that you can relax. I think so much of, of you know, people sort of making good work is generally, I think there's a myth that you have to make something stressful and unpleasant to make good art. And I think that's just nonsense. And I think we should all be having a lovely time because we have the best job in the world. And, you know, obviously there are stresses and strains on everyone's job, but for the most part, like this is, you know, dressing up and telling stories. It's what you dream of, you know, um, and Emerald shares that sensibility. And so, you know, we were so, I just, yeah, I felt, so lucky to have somebody who completely had my back creatively, but also like on a personal level as well. What was for each of you the most challenging day on set or the most challenging scene to shoot for, for whatever reason, could be logistical, could be you're losing the light. I mean, we were up against it a lot. I'm just trying to think there was certainly so the so the so the scene where Cassie is eating a hot dog and walking past the sort of crusher machine that day she was supposed to be walking along some train tracks which we'd you know we'd um diligently checked were not live all of those sorts of things and then on the day somebody said actually we don't know that somebody has just come and said we don't we can't be sure and there was just no way obviously I was ever going to do anything like that so we suddenly were looking at a you know an incredibly dull road um but then uh this guy in one of the kind of depots on the road was kind of crushing cars with this thing and it was maybe like I don't know five five thirty was the end of the day we were losing the light it had to look like dawn um and my yeah the amazing producer Fiona just ran up to him and said will you sir please stay for half an hour so we can shoot this beautiful movie star in front of you please please and he was like yeah yeah sure but you know so stuff like that sometimes the disasters become I mean I, we would never have been able to afford that shot <laughs> if we'd done it properly Are you kidding we couldn't have afforded that you know that machine <laughs> So, so, you know, it's kind of, there's that, there's the thrill, but I think in general for me, it wasn't anything specific. I think the hardest thing was knowing that we were just always like, you know, within a, a millimeter of just, we were just, we pushed up against what was possible all, all day. And that it was a sort of pervasive feeling of terror. But yeah, that's, I think for me, what it was like. Carrie, for you? There were a, uh couple I mean they're all kind of spoilery so I sort of you know feel um I suppose most of the the stuff that was probably you know tougher was stuff that is a bit of a giveaway um I always say that shooting the Paris Hilton uh dance pharmacy scene was one of the most challenging days of my career in that it was so embarrassing 
and I found it mortifying and Emerald had to this was one of the moments where Emerald really had to you know it was an example of Emerald pushing me in a moment where I was trying to retreat and I spent the first sort of two takes sort of watching Bo and saying oh I don't think Cassie would dance I don't think Cassie would do it and like pretty much staring at the floor until Emerald came in and said come on yes she would get into it um so then I was like okay fine but that was quite uh that was yeah that was quite um a tricky first couple of takes and then after that I mean it was all bets were off but um yeah I mean like it, it was it was such a constant joy I don't know if I would describe any of it really as difficult it was you know there was like crunchy fun acting stuff to do but you know it was it was 23 days and when it was over mm. I felt bereft because it just wasn't long enough um so yeah it was just so much fun uh, this film is already sparking so much conversation. What what was it like when you had that premiere at the Sundance Film Festival and, and sort of unleashed this movie on the world and, and, and had that enormously, uh, like not just positive reaction, but something where I imagine people really want to talk to you about it afterwards. I mean, that that has to be the greatest feeling on, on to some extent, but also kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, it, I remember, I kind of can't remember, I think I was in a fugue state of like, I just didn't, I just couldn't believe what was happening. So my brain had kind of gone on, gone on autopilot a bit. But yeah, it's sort of both thrilling and, and frightening, I think, too, because you sort of have let, you're suddenly sort of letting this thing that has been so personal and so close to all of us that we work so hard to make something you're it's so vulnerable, you're so vulnerable, and you put it out there. And actually, any sort of reaction is always going to be a little bit disquieting because you're sort of, although you hope people will watch it and like it and want to talk about it, you're also sort of, it's, it feels kind of like therapy, you know, it feels almost like talking about therapy to every, everyone suddenly. So, it, so it's, yeah, I, I think that the after party afterwards, which was so lovely and had like so many of the crew came and it was so wonderful. And I know it felt so supported and everyone was lovely, but I just remember feeling like, like what's, ha what's happening? Like what's, this is not this. I just don't know how to process this really. And so that's kind of why this gap has been so nice in a funny way, even though it's been kind of devastating in lots of ways, the gap, has given me a bit of like space to feel proud of it and to and to be okay with other people looking at it. I think I felt very I felt very vulnerable then at Sundance probably no matter how lovely people were. I think it was you know I just finished making it and it was overwhelming. Mm. I I only wish it had come out sooner so we could have seen lots of Cassie nurses at Halloween. Um, but there was no Halloween, so <laughs> <laughs> it was cancelled. <laughs> so maybe, maybe next year. Um, well, it is such a fantastic movie. I'm I'm so happy, honestly, that people seem to get it and are responding so positively to it. Um, and I just want to thank you both so much for being here. Congratulations on wonderful work, and um, I can't wait to see what either of you do next. And I, and I hope you work together again soon. <laughs> yes, please, desperately. I mean, care has just ruined me for anyone else, really. I'll be like, oh, well, Carrie wouldn't have done it like that, but <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here, and thank you everyone at home for watching. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you.